So uh, it is now uh, three minutes after 12, and I'd like to welcome everybody, uh, whatever time it is in your, in your time zone all around the world. So I'm Stuart Schoenfeld. I'm the host of today's virtual book webinar uh, on, Dan, Dan, on Dan Rabinowitz's new book, The Power of Deserts. I'm going to introduce the people you see on the screen first myself, and then Karen Mock, uh, who will give you greetings from JSpace, and then Dan and David. So I manage the website Environment and Climate in the Middle East. Uh, this started as a shared, as a personal project to help me in my research. I work on environmental issues in the Eastern Mediterranean, and I have a special interest in efforts to promote environmental cooperation between parties who have been long-term adversaries but share a common challenge of sustainability under conditions of environmental degradation, scarcity, and extreme warning due to climate change. I made the site public in order to help others who are thinking regionally about the challenges of environment and climate change. So if you're interested, you just Google in parentheses environment and climate in the Middle East, and you'll find the link there. Now, JSpace is the, co is the sponsor and co-host of the event. Uh, since uh, 2011, JSpace uh, describes itself as the home for pro-peace, pro-Israel Canadians. It's an all-volunteer, nonpartisan organization that strives to serve as a voice for moderation and social justice, both in Israel and Canada. In 2019, last year, a little um, around so, so a few months after this time, JSpace held its most recent conference and included a well-received panel on climate and water issues in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and in the broader Middle East. So this webinar continues that focus. Now I'm going to uh, now introduce Karen Mock, uh, who will welcome you uh, on behalf of JSpace. Karen is the president of JSpace. She's a human rights consultant, a psychologist, and a teacher educator. She is one of the few Canadians who is qualified by the courts and human rights tribunals to serve as an expert on anti-Semitism, racism, human rights, hate crimes, and hate group activity. She's been involved with JSpace since its launch in 2011 and is a founding director. Karen is a recipient of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for service to peers, community, and country, and she was recently inducted into the Order of Canada. So, Karen, over to you to welcome on behalf of JSpace. Thank you so much, Stuart. It's wonderful to see you again and to welcome you back to a co-sponsored JSpace event. We were actually delighted to see the strong positive reaction of our conference participants to that amazing panel that you and David Brooks put together that included such notables as Diane Sachs, Paul Kay, and Mohammed al uh, We had all hoped to have a half-day symposium following it up, uh, and there was great interest in that. And then, of course, COVID hit. So we were thrilled when you approached us with this exciting opportunity to help launch Dan Rabinowitz's new book on the power of deserts. I think first I want to thank um, David Grosskind for his uh, significant work in actually doing the technology and hosting of our webinars, of our webinar series. And of course, Barbara Landau for her generous support of the series. Those of you who are not as familiar with JSpace, I hope you come to understand that we strive to create a safe space to have some of the difficult conversations and challenging conversations. We do not believe that legitimate criticism of this constructive criticism of the state of Israel is anti-Semitic 
And in fact, when we even look at environmental issues, climate change, or any other issues that impact on the conflict, we want to have the courageous conversations. So to that end, we're going to devote the later part of this session to questions and answers. We'd like to acknowledge those who are asking the questions. So we don't prefer to have people listed as anonymous. If for some reason you feel you can't identify yourself, then we'll understand that. But we're going to strive to make this a conversation. And let's hope, God willing, that by our next conference, we'll all be able to gather to raise up the progressive liberal Zionist voice in support of Israel, in support of Palestine, and in support of peace. Thank you again, Stuart, for initiating this. Thank you, David Brooks, and of course, Dan. Back to you, Stuart, and I'll join you again later on to help wrap up the session. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. So let me introduce you to the other two faces that you see on the screen. Our author, Dan Rabinowitz, is Professor of Sociology and Anthropology at Tel Aviv University. He is Chairman of the Association for Environmental Justice in Israel. He was head of, of the Tel Aviv University's Porter School of, Econo of Environmental Studies and Chairman of Greenpeace Mediterranean. Dan received the Pratt Prize for Environmental Journalism in 2012 and in 2016 received the Green Globe Award for Environmental Leadership. He's the author of nine books, scores of articles in academic journals, and many commentaries in print and electronic publications. Environmental work is one aspect of his career, but there is another strong theme in his work. Dan is among the few Israeli academics who have researched and written in partnership with Palestinian citizens of Israel. Our other uh, panelist is David Brooks, who we invited to be discussant. David was educated in geology and economics and spent much of his professional career with Canada's International Development Research Center. After retirement, he continued with research and with advising several Canadian NGOs on water and energy issues. David's main research interests are the water soft past, an approach to sustainable governance of fresh water, and water demand in the Middle East, with particular emphasis on Israel and Palestine. He attended many of the multilateral talks about water that were part of the Middle East peace project process. In 2012, uh, Dr. Brooks received an honorary doctorate in, from the University of Waterloo. After the presentation, David will have the chance to make comments and he and I will share in fielding questions. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a Q&A button that allows you to submit questions. And as Karen has mentioned, uh, we uh, do not uh, uh, want the question to come in anonymously, but we, uh, 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 we ask you to identify yourselves when you submit a question. A few words of introduction about the book before I turn over to Dan. This is a relatively brief book, but it has the unusual combination of being packed with information while at the same time being highly readable. The Power of Deserts is an exceptionally well presented treatment of how the power generated by oil has transformed the societies of the Middle East for both better and worse, the sustainable future for the region, or the, pardon me, the challenge of a sustainable future for the region, uh, if the status quo continues, and an insightful presentation of the case for moving rapidly to a massive expansion of solar power generation. And to make it even better, as I've noted before, this is a very reasonably priced book. And after the, uh, the session today, all the registrants will receive an email with a link to a discount.
which makes it even uh, more uh, more reasonably priced. So I think this has the potential for being a very important book. I think the argument is one that that needs to be shared widely and widely discussed, and it's an optimistic way forward out of a very serious crisis. So Dan, I will now turn over to you. Thank you very much, um, Stuart, for this um, forgiving introduction. I'm uh, really happy to be hosted here by JSpace Canada, and I'd like to thank Karen um, for Sp JSpace's hospitality, and also to join her in thanking David Kroskin for all the technical assistance that he's been giving us. Uh, I think uh, you, uh, Stuart, deserve special thanks, um, uh, both for your initiative, which I think is now over 20 years old, um, of uh, environment and climate in the Middle East, which is uh, and has always been um, a really a real inspiration for many of us. And you also made this connection with JSpace Canada today, so thank thank you and thank uh, and I would like to thank David Brooks. Uh, an expert on environmental issues in this region for his willingness to make comments today and I'm eagerly um, awaiting those. Um, the um, power of deserts cover four main issues and um, I will uh, only briefly describe three of them and then go to the fourth. His first part, part, part reviews climate predictions for the Middle East, and it doesn't look good. The second uh, analyzes a, a number of cl climate inequalities that exist both between and within countries in the Middle East. These uh, climate inequalities exist everywhere, but they are harsher uh, in the Middle East than in, in other regions. And a third topic it touches upon is that it highlights the nexus between global warming uh, agricultural failure and, 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 and problems in food production, forced migration and insecurity. Um, Sudan and Syria are obviously the, are the obvious uh, examples. Uh, I will not dwell on these three issues in my opening remarks, but uh, I'm happy to go back to them in the Q&A. What I do want to do in the next few minutes is to present the fourth element which makes the book's chief argument. And in a nutshell, it claims um, the following. The global energy transition has begun, but it has come too late and is progressing too slowly. Um, so we, are, we might be losing the race against time to curb climate change. And third, um, the oil rich kingdoms of the Persian Gulf, about whom I write in some, at, at some length in the book, have currently both the motivation and also the ability to accelerate this transition. And if they do that, then they could play a very positive part in the global effort to avoid climate chaos. I guess this is the optimistic streak that uh, Stuart has, um, has mentioned that exists in the book. So I begin with the, with the good news, if you like. The energy transition um, has begun. Um, this, uh, I'm, I'm not even talking about coal, which is on its last legs and is really being phased out. Um, it's, it's a done deal with, with coal almost everywhere around the world. And that, uh, that uh, accounts for, uh, until recently, in, for about 40% of greenhouse gas em em emissions. But, it's, but the more interesting story is with uh, oil. This is a reminder in this slide of the global demand for oil by, by sectors. And of course, transportation is up there with uh, more than 50% of global oil um, consumption of, every year going to transportation. And we know where transporta transportation is going today. It's going there and it's going there and it's going even there. Uh, by 2025, all major producers, car producers will have hybrid or fully electric models on the road. By 2030, you will be hard pressed to buy a new car with a traditional internal combustion engine because the industry will have gone uh, electric almost complete, completely. Aviation and heavy industry will change much slower 
uh, but change will come there too. Maybe not in ten years, but in in, in a bit in a bit more. Uh, this the, the bottom uh, slide is uh, is uh, is a is a um, concentrator concentrated solar power plant that can produce temperatures of up to a thousand degrees Celsius and can um, replace some of some of the fossil fuels used even in um, heavy industry. So by mid century between all these changes, demand for oil could be less than half its, uh, its current level. Meanwhile, there is another revolution that is happening, the solar revolution in power production. It doesn't impact oil so much because not much oil goes into power production, but it is most pertinent for natural gas, which is relevant for my analysis as well, because uh, the, the part of the world we're interested in produces both oil and, uh, and gas. Um, this is the share of energy from renewable uh, sources in the, in, the, in the EU member states. You don't have to uh, look into all the details, but you can, you can see the general picture. Uh, 2018, um, EU in general on the left has almost 20% of its power coming from renewables. Some countries like Sweden and Finland and others where you also have nuclear uh, and, and, and hydroelectric are even higher, but this is certainly a, a transition that is already happening. And this is a projection for mid-century 2050 um, done by the International Renewable Energy uh, Agency, um, which predicts that uh, by 2050, 65 of total air energy consumed could come from renewables, according to one quite realistic uh, scenario that they produce. Uh, you may have heard that uh, when you look forward into the future now, almost 70% of new power plants that are either being planned or have been commissioned are a renewable energy based and only 30% of them are fossil fuels. So we can see where uh, this is going. And the reason uh, why all of this is happening is um, encapsulated, I think, in the, golden, in the golden graph that goes from the top left uh, where it says 359 uh, to the bottom right where it says 20. This is the cost of producing a megawatt of electricity using um, solar solar panels and it has plunged by more than 90 percent in a decade this while other um, types of energy used for power production have either stayed the same or even gone a little bit up so we are really um, um, heading into uh, the age of solar uh, solar energy is now account now accounts for only about two just over two percent of um, power production um, globally and could go up to 25 by 2050. And this is really the key economics of, uh, of, of what we are witnessing and will go on witnessing. Um, so if we now look at greenhouse gas em emissions and we look at 2016, the, the, the situation has become only a little bit worse since then. So out of a total of 35 billion tons of, uh, of greenhouse gas uh, of, of CO2 equivalent uh, emitted to the atmosphere, electricity and heat, which you see at, up at the, at, the, at the top, accounts for 43% and transport for about 22. And um, if transporta transportation does go electric, and it is going there, and if electricity production goes renewable, which is also uh, where it's going, then between these two sectors of electricity and heat and transport, we could soon have 65% of greenhouse gas emissions saved. Throw in a bit of uh, electrification and solarification, also in industry, agriculture, uh, building, and this figure could realistically reach even 70 or 80% of all emissions uh, within a few decades. So this is uh, good news. The energy transition is happening, but is it happening fast enough? This is a big question that we are now facing. Um, and I think the, the, the answer, and many of you I think will, will agree with me so far, is a resounding no. So we have a, a revolution underway, but it's not happening uh, quickly enough. And the reason 
has to do with a very sophisticated and deeply entrenched and very robust regime of subsidies for fossil fuels, which keeps them afloat even when the market is turning against them, as, as we could see. Um, and uh, carbon subsidies are ubiquitous and they come in different forms. They can come as tax incentives and very low royalties for fossil fuel extraction. Some places it comes as infrastructure freebies for industry from, for, from governments. Um, in other places, it's reduced taxes on energy intensive industries and their products. Um, uh, subsidies for fuel and electricity prices, retail prices and industry bailouts and, and many more. Um, so uh, this is the reason why uh, I'm saying that the good news of the energy transition is mixed with the bad news that all of this is going uh, too slowly and, 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 this is, and this is why. Now let us turn to the Persian Gulf uh, with all this and um, mainly to the six kingdoms by the Gulf, uh, as I call them. Saudi Arabia is the biggest and uh, most uh, dominant of them, but Kuwait and Bahrain, Qatar, the UAE and Oman are, are the others. Um, they are all part of a uh, organization called the Gulf Cooperation Council, which they established back in the 1980s, mainly to better coordinate the production and marketing of oil and gas. The Gulf Cooperation Council it's called GCC, and I sometimes refer to this group of, of countries as the GCC-6. Uh, and they, it's also important to note that uh, the GCC-6 uh, make the backbone of OPEC, uh, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. We will come back to that uh, in a minute. Uh, they are important because, as you can see on the, in, the brown, um, in the brown section on the right, they are responsible for 28% of um, oil production in the world today. They are also um, responsible for almost 30% of reserves. So they're big players, small countries, but big players in the, in the international oil market and natural gas. Um, and of course, this has given them a, a, a boost of prosperity in the last 50 or 60 years, which is second to none in, 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 in world, in human history. Um, this is the average annual uh, GDP growth for these six countries in this 20 year, 26 year period between 1990 to 2016. So on average, they grew by every year by seven or eight, in, in the case of Qatar, 12%. Uh, and here you can see how their overall GDP leapt in a 40 year period between 73 and 2014. So look at the bottom, the United Arab Emirates economy grew 100, almost 140 fold in these 40 years, uh, Saudi Arabia's um, uh, economy grew 50 times. And this is a period in which Germany and the US only grew by um, 10 and 14 uh, uh, times uh, respectively. Uh, another indication, UAE energy consumption per capita, per capita grew fivefold since 1973. Um, so we are really talk, look, looking at, uh, at an area that has had amazing prosperity and, 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 and untold re rich, rich, riches in the last uh, 50 years. The future, however, now looks much less bright than it used to look um, a decade ago, uh, because there are two looming perils, uh, one of them we've already mentioned. Um, oil is becoming, is coming to to its end, as, 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 we, as we analyzed before. Um, uh, and this, for the GCC6, spells real trouble. It could land them uh, in the same place uh, where the salt barons of Europe found themselves in the 19th century. Salt was an important commodity in pre-modern Europe. It was the only way to preserve food and mainly meat. Um, and those who owned uh, salt mines were important economically and even politically in countries like Poland and Austria and many other places. Then electric uh, refrigeration uh, replaced salt in meat preservation, decimated demand for salt and made it almost redundant economically. Um, so that is the, the first peril that is looming over uh, over the Gulf. The other peril 
is of course climate change. The Gulf has one of the harshest climate predictions uh, on earth. It is uh, part of uh, the warm desert climate belt of the southern um, uh, Middle East. Um, it's, it's actually a depression surrounded by mountain ridges from all sides, including from the south, which blocks the chilling effect of the Indian Ocean and creates a humidity and heat trap uh, with extreme harsh conditions already, already now. Um, these are the figures for the annual uh, daily uh, average temperatures, not, not the average highs, the, the, the daily average that incorporates already day and night uh, for Kuwait um, uh, in the period of uh, around the turn of the century. So you can see that the average uh, daily temperature is about 35, 36 degrees uh, 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 centigrade. And, uh, and that already takes into account nights that are slightly cooler, maybe around 30, but days which are regularly over 43, 42 or 43 as, uh, as a daily high. And this is what is expected in the models, six or seven degrees higher than uh, things were around the turn of the century. So we're looking um, at in August and September in Kuwait for a 40, 2.5 uh, daily average, which indicates daily highs regularly over 50 every day for two or three months. And the range goes up to even higher, as you can see at the, at the, at the, at the, at the edge of the blue uh, patch on, 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 the, on, this, uh, on this prediction. Um, so we're looking at double trouble in the Gulf, post oil and the post normal climate era which uh, I argue creates, already is creating a, a sense of urgency about the future, which wasn't there before. And, and here I come to the main thrust of my argument, uh, could perhaps drive the GCC6 to help themselves as they approach this ambiguous and problematic future in ways that might help also others. Um, now, besides oil and gas, the kingdoms by the Gulf have one more natural resource, which they're only beginning to awaken to, and that is, uh, and that is sunshine. Um, the actual figures are not that important. Uh, I would just say generally that in terms of solar radiation, it's one of the richest places on, on the planet. Very, very few cloudy days a year and over double the average amount of energy um, uh, so seen here as kilowatt hour per meter square per year uh, compared to uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, so they have lots of sunshine. They also have an abundance of unproductive land because of uh, lack of water. And land, of course, is very important when we're looking at uh, solar um, photovoltaic panels, which need very large surfaces to produce uh, to produce electricity. Uh, they also have a lot of available capital, uh, which is needed uh, when you are looking at renewable energy. Uh, most of the capital investment in these uh, in these initiatives come um, up front, uh, and then you don't have any ongoing uh, energy bills from month to month. But that is also available in the in the Gulf today. And another thing is that they have a very impressive record of incorporating innovation into their civil infrastructure. These are not countries that are particularly strong on innovation per se, but they know how to integrate it. This, this, these are uh, photos from uh, Masdar City, which is a totally renewable energy place uh, just outside of uh, Abu Dhabi with uh, special uh, transportation systems and, 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 and other facilities. Um, and as we indicated before, even for them, the numbers uh, begin to look very favorable uh, when you look at renewables. These are uh, tenders um, that were uh, um, put out by uh, various governments uh, in the GCC uh, in uh, 2015, 14, and even 18. The important uh, figure here is to look at the, at the yellow bars, which represent the costs that the governments uh, in, uh, in in UAE and, and other places in the Gulf uh, and ended up paying to companies that won the uh, the, the, uh, the tenders to build um, 
solar power plants. And you can see that the lowest price uh, on this chart is the 2.34 uh, US um, uh, dollars per uh, US cents per per, uh, per kilowatt, um, which is for a solar solar uh, PV uh, plant, and uh, the blue ones are for conventional uh, fossil fuel um, uh, stations, power stations that were built at the same time. So you can see that even for these mass producers of fossil fuels. Uh, uh, solar is now becoming cheaper. So there is a good incentive for them to uh, turn in that direction. Um, and, and these latest figures, by the way, are from 2018. Uh, prices of solar have gone even further south uh, since then. Um, so I end by asking this, could the GCC6 help accelerate the global energy transition. What if, in the interest of self-preservation, as they look into the post-oil era and the post-normal climate condition, uh, the 200 men, give or take, who effectively controlled these six countries, uh, decide now to do, uh, to do this. First, to accelerate their own in transformation to renewables which they have been declaring and pledging for years, uh, even though only the United Arab Emirates have done real things uh, in that direction and now produce about 3.5% of their energy from solar plants. Uh, the others, Saudi Arabia and the, and, the, and the others are below 1%. So one thing they could do is accelerate their own transition. Tra transition. The numbers are there for them and they have been declaring that this is what they want to do and intend to do for a long time. The second, they could invest heavily in renewable capacity and, technolo and technology uh, globally. Um, they are looking for what to do with their money uh, for, the, for the future when oil will no, will no longer be able to sustain them. Um, the, 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 they need, for example, oil to sell for about $80 a, bar a barrel to keep their books balanced. And it's now selling for 40. It was 60 before nice. COVID, yeah. then went down lower and came back to about at about 60. Um, so that's the second thing they could do. Third is that they could pick the right moment, say five or ten years from now, when they have already secured quite a good proportion of the global market in renewables, to dramatically reduce their own oil and uh, gas production production. So willfully bring bring on, if you like, the end of oil. Uh, this will abruptly reduce the global supply by about 25 or 30 uh, percent. It will force prices up a notch, not dramatically, because demand is falling and has become really quite flexible, but just enough to finally position renewables as the cheapest and safest and most attractive form of uh, energy. When this happens, the GCC will be able to, to, first of all, cash in on their earlier investment in renewables. And in fact, they will have used their current market power in the energy, in the, in the, oil, uh, in the oil market, um, to create a, a similarly dominant position in the energy market of the future, where renewables uh, will reign supreme. Um, this, could, this could, of course, if we go back to the race against time that I was describing, shorten the transition to renewables by maybe a decade, perhaps more, um, at a very crucial moment in our history. It will give the international community a, a very important boost in the race against time to curb uh, global warming. And um, on top of everything, it will secure the Gulf uh, a place, if you like, on the right side of history. Um, which will be a welcome change for us, for a culture and a civilization which has been vilified and denigrated for, for, for decades now. Now this all might look counterintuitive um, to you and perhaps even impossible. The goose produces golden eggs, why kill it, uh, and so on. Um, but there is another way of looking at it and I'd like to leave you with, uh, with, with a thought about that. Um, the other way of looking at it would be the way that William Durant looked at things at the turn of the 20th uh, century. 
Um, Durant was America's leading carriage maker in the late 19th century. He was a millionaire at 30, a pillar of society. Uh, when motor cars came along in the 1890s, he objected. He said they were noisy, they were smelly, they were dangerous. He joined all sorts of citizens' protests that demanded bigger and, and tighter government, government regulation. Uh, he didn't even allow his daughter to ride in a car. But then in 1903, uh, the, the penny dropped for William Durant. He realized that the horseless carriage was here to stay and decided on a change. Of he, he declared that he was going to build a motor car so silent, clean and safe, nobody will ever need government intervention uh, again. He bought a, um, a small company in trouble in Flint, Michigan called Buick. He uh, joined hands with Hen Henry Chevrolet, created a GM, and the rest is history. So will they go down that road? Um, I think the trajectory I am describing here, whereby those most associated with oil and climate obstruction suddenly become champions of renewables, is credible because it does not assume a change of heart or an ideological transformation on their part. Rather, it takes greed and thirst for power, object objectionable as they are, for granted. And it suggests that um, choices open for the kingdoms by the Gulf in the post-oil era, um, which coincides, of course, with the post-normal climate era, could actually make the change. Um, I leave you with this image. There are, uh, if you like, to make, to make it even more provocative, uh, we could go in the trajectory and that, 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 that I have been part of for the last 30 years, uh, represented here by uh, Greta Thunberg, the, if you like, the environmental pathway towards climate redemption. We all believe the science, we get uh, the right uh, plan of, of change. We convince people uh, widely that this is where we need to go, that, uh, that people have to change their consumption patterns. We then convince politicians and become dominant enough polit politically to, 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 to force the hand of politicians to eventually to do what they've been trying not to do for, for 30 years, and that is to, um, to compel uh, the big uh, emitters and consumers to stop emitting. This is, if you like, the Al Gore, Greta Thunberg uh, uh, trajectory. The other, represented here by Mohammed bin Salman, is the one that I'm suggesting. Uh, I, can, I can imagine and, 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 and guess uh, morally and ideologically which part of the picture you are with. Uh, the question is, uh, what's going to work? What's going to work for us more efficaciously? I'll stop here. I think. Thank you for listening so far. Dan, thank you. That was very provocative, full of information, and uh, I'm sure has uh, put a lot of thoughts in people's minds. Uh, I'm going to ask David to make comments and ask the first question. And I see we're already starting to get questions on the Q&A buttons at the bottom. So if you, uh, you can begin to, to add your questions to those that are there and we will get to them as, uh, as, as we can. We'll probably go for maybe another half an hour uh, and then uh, uh, Karen will tell us what the plans are for following up. Okay, so David, comments? Surely. Uh, as many of you know, this is not the, uh, the first time issues of this kind have been on the agenda for JSpace. Uh, not only at the last biennial conference did we have a program, but just about two months ago we had a webinar, and that focused on my area of concentration, which is water in Israel, and, and inherently, given the integrated nature of the ge uh, hydrogeography, also of Palestine, and to a lesser degree, Jordan and the uh, 
uh, countries to the north. Um, so I want to build on that and try to bring parts of this uh, a little bit t together. And um, <laughs> I've, uh, I've been to almost all of the countries in the Jordan. I guess I have been to all of the countries in the Jordan River Valley. Um, and that's uh, the area I know best. So let me think about how we can take what is currently a, a rather positive um, approach to water, fresh water that is. And, and let me immediately jump in and say one thing. When I talk about fresh water, I am mainly thinking about irrigation. Uh, for those who think about what, what about drinking water, it's of course critically important but it is a small term. The bulk of the world's water is used for irrigation. And that's the, uh, the term you have to think about when you're working about it. And that is what, what is also true in uh, Israel, Palestine, and uh, Jordan. Now, uh, to be specific, uh, one of the great potential, what is developing is a, a new, really a, a new source of water at, at utility levels. That is not just uh, um, micro plants, but large scale production of fresh water from seawater, from say, say highly saline water, but mainly seawater. This is a major transition. Um, but it is highly energy intensive. So the notion that we could have renewably based solar, uh, I mean, uh, desalination plants is of major importance. Um, however, the problem for Israel is there isn't a lot of land. There's a big demand, but not a lot of land. That's the bad part of the story. The good part of the story is that just across the Jordan River, there is a country that is uh, sizable, uh, not quite as well placed as the GCC uh, uh, countries in solar radiation, but it has a lot. What is the potential? I'm gonna, there's a question for Dan uh, what is the potential for uh, building solar plants in Jordan that would export their electricity, part, partly use it their own self? They have their own water problem, of course, in Jordan, a, a much greater one, I should say, than in Israel or Palestine, but, uh, but exporting a large part of it for solar plants in Jordan. So solar desalination plants in Israel. What's the potential there? Okay, I would say that the potential is there. Um, um, and I, but I will say also this, uh, Israel has really made quite a lot of uh, um, progress in the last few years on solar. It now is second in the world after only Honduras in, uh, in the percentage of the electricity produced in it that comes from solar at about 8.7% of, uh, of all electricity. I don't think, uh, David, that the limiting factor that um, stands between Israel and, 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 and tripling this or even quadrupling this uh, this proportion is land. I think that um, land, of course, is an, is an issue, but there is enough land, for example, in, in the Negev. Um, having said that, uh, well, and I would also say that the limiting factor now in terms of the technology is storage. You need to, uh, to develop new ways of storing uh, electricity day to night uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the winter and so on. Um, but this is also, there's a lot of progress being made. But I will take your question, David, and look at it more widely for the whole region. I think that the notion of having super grids 
that trans trans that go across national borders is very much part of the vision of the Middle East generally and of the GCC itself there has been talk it in the GCC of uh, creating a super grid that would inter interconnect the six of them because uh, there, there are no there are now have independent networks but also uh, export um, uh, uh, electricity much of it would come from solar energy to Iraq even Iran parts of Iran uh, and and even further uh, north and south to to Yemen and also across the Sinai to to Egypt so I think that the notion that you will be able to create cheap electricity from uh, solar energy in countries that can afford the uh, the, uh, the investment and that would would have a regional impact is very much part of, of the way things um, people are thinking about the future of energy in the Middle East. Why, why don't we go to some of the questions right now? Okay, yeah. so uh, I have a question, but I'm going to defer to Miriam Diamond, who says that she has to leave very soon because she has uh, a couple of comments that I think uh, would be worthwhile for Dan to respond to. Uh, and let me remind you, if you're submitting questions, please submit them. Do not submit them anonymously. We ask you to attach your names to the questions. So uh, Miriam made a, a first comment that the oil and gas industry are maintaining profitability by diverting their products into plastics. And just what, you might, what a comment on that. And the other comment has to do with the need for rare earth in order to uh, to power uh, solar panels. and. How does, the, how does access to rare earth impact your uh, 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 your proposals? So, Dan, you want to respond to both those comments? Um, yes, plastic. Um, the production of, of, of plastic has its share of environmental problems, but uh, greenhouse gas emissions is not necessarily uh, paramount amongst, uh, amongst them. About, if I remember correctly, the figure it's about between 10 and 12 percent of global oil demand goes to uh, uses that do not involve combustion, uh, like the production of uh, of uh, of plastic, but but also of other things that are maybe not as environmentally harmful. Um, so 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 yes, I think that uh, to the extent that uh, people would still be using oil for these uh, uses. Uh, and it also has to do with uh, production of paint and and and, and a variety of of, uh, of, of solvents and and, and and generally the the the, the, uh, the chemical industry. I think that the residue of oil that would still be used and would still be in demand uh, after uh, electrification of transportation and after we go through the uh, transition into renewables, also in power production. Um, so some oil would still be used but if we are mainly concerned with climate change then the impact of climate change is not necessarily so high because these are again are not this is not a combustible uh, use of uh, of oil so that's uh, to the first point what was the second point Stuart remind me the availability of rare earth and rare earth means uh, it, it means I, I guess literally means uh, earth or, or territory, or does it mean it's no, something? No, rare, rare earth. That's which is a chemical compound, a mineral compound required for the production of solar panels. Ah, yes. Okay. So, uh, so, so yes, this is uh, this is this is uh, this is certainly a, a a problem and a limiting factor in in, in the production process and the supply chain of a solar panel. Uh, I'm not an expert on the on the production process by which solar panels are are being produced, mostly in in China. Um, and uh, but I still think that uh, that to the extent that this will become a, a problem in the future, uh, I uh, hope that there will be a, a technological solution that would be, that will be able to somehow go around this problem. I I, I think that the, the 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 potential for for solar is so. It uh, is so important for any hope for us to, to tackle climate change that this needs to be the case. If I can just, if I can just jump in and add, there are a number. Perhaps the most, the largest uh, problem is cobalt. 
Um, and unfortunately, the uh, available supplies, it's not so much a physical limitation, although, you know, it's not that they're, they're not available in the quantities like um, copper or even nickel, but um, they're in countries that are unstable, dictatorial, and otherwise uh, not the kind you want to, uh, uh, to, to, to deal with any more than you have to. However, um, it's typical of geology that when something becomes attractive, um, people find new sources. And I would only suggest that when I was working as a young geologist, it never occurred to me that there would be diamonds in Canada. <laughs> but indeed there are. And uh, there are, and that's my expectation is that new sources will be found as markets develop for these other sources. And um, so it, it's, it's not something, it's a good question, but it's not something I worry about. Okay. I, I want to ask, go back to the question that's been in my mind and pull us back somewhat to the J-Space agenda, which is focused on peace building and understanding the politics of the Middle East and how we can move forward. Uh, you're an Israeli academic and you've written a, a policy proposals for the GCC. So there are kind of two questions. One is, you know, why isn't there an, uh, an Arab co-author on this to give it a kind of standing in the Arab world? And secondly, given that there's not uh, anybody in the GCC reading this, any contacts with people, you know, outside of Israel or outside of the circles that we're accustomed to? And how do you see this? And you can also comment on what impact this might have for the prospects for peace in the region. Yes, and I've seen in the Q and A uh, that people have, have asked whether there is a with our whether I think there are, there is a relationship uh, between the UAE's decision to uh, for rapprochement with Israel and 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 the whole this this whole conundrum. Um, so where should where should I start, Stuart? Why don't you start uh, with with with. Had, did you give any, is there a reason why there's not an Arab co-author? Well, I guess you're asking this, uh, Stuart, because you know that in the past I have uh, habitually uh, uh, co-authored uh, uh, books and articles with, with Palestinian um, co-writers. Mm -hmm. um, still working on, 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 on finding the right, um, the right partner in terms of environmental thought, but, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and ready for your guidance on this. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. our, our, yeah. our affiliation also with our Rabbi Institute might yeah. be a, a way into this. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Uh, but I stand corrected on writing this book alone. Still, still. <laughs> do you have any sense that, that it's being, that, well, it's a, it's a new book, but what do you, do you have any uh, professional contacts with people in the energy sector, the solar sector in the Arab world? Uh, I, I'll just say without going into details that there are inroads and that mm -hmm. I'm hoping to to be able to you know to, to to talk about this more freely in the in the future. Okay. But uh, but yes, this is something that has been on my mind for for a while. I waited for the book to actually come out, but even since it came out mm -hmm. two weeks ago, uh, there, there 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 are some uh, some some inroads and 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 I'm really looking forward to that because. Mm -hmm. Because yes, it's it is you 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 put it sort of bluntly that this is a a policy um, recommendation for for the GCC six uh, uh, certainly that part of the book uh, and obviously like anyone writing policy papers I'd like somebody to read them preferably with uh, the ability to to act on them mm -hmm. uh, for the question about the UAE's and now Bahrain's uh, um, motivation for uh, rapprochement with Israel. It's a complex issue uh, which, which involves lots of considerations, anything from uh, regional cooperation against Iran to being on the good books of the, um, America for arms and other reasons to, ma to maybe trying to help in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, situation. I uh, think, and I've, and I've, uh, and I don't, I haven't included it in the book because the the book was uh, was published before the breakthrough with the UAE, 
But I have written an op-ed article in Haaretz about this about 10 days ago, uh, arguing that uh, the, the new alignment of forces in the, in the Middle East and this new initiative on the part of GCC six countries to open up to Israel and, and beyond must be seen within the context of post oil. Post oil is something that could really bring um, a devastating change for, 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 for these countries and they need to look at new alliances and to forge new um, collaborations. And I think that in a, on a general, in, in a general sense, I think this is part of the context. I'm not saying it's everything, but it, it's part of the context in within, within which we must look mm -hmm. at, um, at the recent developments. David, you want to field the next yeah, question? I was thinking about um, bringing this back to this uh, Israel-Palestine. Um, what have you seen, uh, what interest do you find from uh, Palestinian engineers, scientists, and the, uh, the government of Palestine uh, for moving toward a renewable economy in, in their ideally, uh, whatever, however you see uh, the future government for Palestine, how much is there um, thought going into renewables? I think that uh, it's recent. Uh, the uh, power production in, in the Palestinian authorities uh, is, is a sad story, is, is, is a sad story of dependence on Israel for cross-border supply of, of electricity, which is still entangled. Uh, and it's, it, it has its, uh, its uh, a, a certain form in Gaza and a, and a, and a, and a slightly different form in the, in the West Bank. But I think that on the whole, you could say that power production, <coughs> electricity production for the Palestinian Authority has been uh, a thorny issue. Um, uh, the, the, there's very little power that they produce themselves. They get almost everything from Israel and some. <laughs> From, uh, from, from Jordan and some from, from Egypt for Gaza. Um, having said that, I think that uh, they have now come to realize that um, renewable uh, sources might be easier for them to put together than a new power station, for example, which would probably need to be in area C because this is where you have available land and where you might need to have uh, 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 long-drawn long negotiations with uh, with Israel. I think that in a way, because solar panels can be put in cumulatively and 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 and, and are really uh, involve a sort of smaller incremental decisions rather than a major policy decision like a new power station, could uh, could be attractive for them. And I think this is also attractive for the main sources of funding, uh, which was for many years the European Union and now the United States, and and also in the future for um, for, for the Gulf states, which are now uh, financing the, the Palestinian Authority both in Gaza and in the West Bank. And within the vision that I'm pushing, this is this is a classic case in which you could use their interest in this new field, the GCC six interest in this new field, plus their um, uh, capital uh, capabilities to exactly do what what I'm saying. Um, I want to refer to something that uh, that came up in the in the Q and A that I that, that, that I that I spotted, and that is, uh, aren't we actually in a way um, um, uh, consolidating the same type of um, of greed and 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 uh, uh, and pressure on the market that the GCC and other large oil producers had in the in the oil market and transferring it to the renewable energy world. It's a very good question. And it's a, it's a question that I've been pondering about um, because uh, it has political and also moral consequences. In a way, uh, you could argue that my uh, my the trajectory that I'm talking about is is perpetuating the same ills that we have had with uh, in the energy market so far 
and just transferring it to to the to the new uh, energy universe of of, of tomorrow. Um, yes, I think this is it's 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 a valid point. If you like, this is what I uh, alluded to when I put up uh, uh, Greta Thunberg's uh, picture next to um, uh, MBSs. Um, I think that we're living in desperate times. I think that uh, we need to uh, to to hold on to anything that can accelerate the energy transition. Um, the house is burning and all hands on deck uh, and this is not uh, and there will be time to sort of to 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 go through who who actually is helping and and, and what other flaws they have when we have secured a future. But the way things are going, uh, I think that uh, uh, that I would I would go at the moment. I would go for, with almost anyone who could uh, uh, who could take us through this uh, very crucial and and and, and acutely uh, important uh, moment in our history, when we could find ourselves in ten or twenty years' time, if we are still in the slow process of. Uh, uh, gradually uh, moving from fossils to renewables and are still emitting more every year more uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions than the, than, 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 than the year before, then I think that there is also a moral imperative to, to do anything we can. But this Can't is we add to that the, um, yeah. something that hasn't been talked about much, but it was came in after the f early discussions about um, about uh, global change toward a su sufficiency. Um, but certainly, it's easier to deal with renewables if you're dealing with small quantities. It's only it, they are yes, they're they've come down at, for a utility level, but if you think about producing for the household level. They are incredibly cheap, and uh, so I think there's there are ways of that that question is superb, uh, mm -hmm. but there also are answers to it, and it's living with less. Hmm. Uh, I'll put my two cents in on in this as well. <laughs> the uh, if you think about the difference between solar and oil, uh, oil is in the ground, and so it generates conflict for control of oil fields. If we take Dan's second proposal, which is that they, that the wealth of the GCC be used to acquire solar assets around the world, what you're doing is building up a distributed power supply, which is globally distributed rather than having being concentrated in certain oil fields. So, so there's potential for solar in many, many places. And so that gives, uh, that uh, it's a disincentive for conflict over scarce resources, and the other thing, and the other part of it is that you know once uh, you have uh, solar solar established, it's established in the places that are using it, so that it's uh, it's there's less of monopoly control than if you have to import oil from halfway around the world through tankers. Um, the uh, I also might mention on the question of is this a potentially sustainable energy transition for uh, the Palestinians that uh, I'll promote uh, I'll promote my website that uh, while I was uh, uh, reminding people who would subscribe to my website about this uh, this presentation today I also saw that an online magazine called This Week in Palestine has as its current issue renewable energy sources in Palestine and uh, with a, a series of, of quite detailed articles about the possibility of, of using solar as a source in Palestine. So uh, again, if you go to quotation marks environment and climate in the Middle East, uh, you'll find a links to, to that full article which you can to that full issue which you can download as a PDF. Uh, it is still you know, a proposal. It's not well developed. But there are people seriously thinking about it within the Palestinian Authority. Uh, the uh, uh, David, do you want to introduce another question? 
I'm looking to see through our list of questions. Let me remind people, please submit questions. We're welcome to have them, but please submit them with your names. There's a very interesting one about natural gas. Natural gas is much less polluting and much more widely distributed in, uh, in many parts of the world, including Israel, which is uh, having its own difficulties deciding how it uh, handles this new source of uh, energy and, uh, and money. Um, to what extent do you think, in your judgment, I have no problem with your statements on oil, but should we be equally hard on natural gas? Or is this, the, is this the transition, the, the, the ideal transition fuel, as uh, was in, the, in early um, alternative energy studies, natural gas was the tradition that would allow us go to, to renewables eventually? I agree. I, I agree it can be the, the transitional, but there is also a limit uh, in, on the temporal scale of how late we want to be with it. I think that we, whichever way you look at it, uh, as, as so much new electricity is being produced by solar and renewables generally, gas is becoming also part of our past rather than part of the future. I, for example, applauded the Israeli Ministry of Energy's decision uh, from last month to suspend the construction of four new gas-powered power stations um, that were planned to, 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 to be built in the next few years. Uh, because the uh, the leap in the capacity for for solar, uh, so Israel is now around 8.7 percent solar out, out of uh, for electricity production, and it and it hopes to be at 30 percent uh, by uh, by 2030. And I think it's realistic uh, for once. One of the meaning, one of the implications of this would be that uh, new plans for gas for gas powered stations would have to be scrapped. Uh, of course, existing uh, gas um, gas fired uh, stations will be with us for the next, you know, for the duration of their longevity, probably 30 or 40 or 50 years ahead. And in that respect, they, they will remain the, transi the transitional fuel. But if you ask me in the Middle East, uh, especially whether to build new gas power station, uh, gas fired power stations today as a transition, and I would say no, the transitional uh, period is 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 drawing to a close, and we should now sort of really dedicate ourselves to a future. Let me make the question a little harder for you, Dan. What if I'm talking about transportation? Now, I'm, I'm not excluding the passenger car, which I think is already on its way to becoming all electric. But I'm thinking about the very large part of the uh, uh, oil use in Canada, which is heavy trucks, uh, and then somewhat less uh, uh, rail, although my guess is that rail is going to be, be a larger rather than a smaller part of the future. Uh, they have lots of capacity to store things. So I'm, I'm not thinking of uh, liquefied natural gas. I'm thinking of just of using natural gas as a propulsion fuel. There may be room for natural gas there, but I think that even with heavy heavy trucks, uh, the breakthroughs, the mo most of the breakthroughs in, in research and development in uh, in energy now is dedicated to storage. Yeah. And I think that the same kind of breakthroughs that we are going to see with large large scale storage that will allow a large town of half a million or a million to rely completely on solar. Uh, and be able to store uh, electricity from day to night and from summer to winter. I think the same kind of breakthroughs, maybe it's a matter of another decade, will make uh, trucking across Canada uh, possible in a in a in a in a large uh, uh, in a in a in a very large and heavy vehicle on electricity as well. So again, uh, there might be a period in which uh, in which uh, gas engines might play a part, but I still think that this is a dying breed. I'm going to summarize what I think are the big takeaways from the presentation today. Uh, then I'll make uh, one other comment and then turn it over to Karen for uh, thank yous and next steps. So what I think are the big takeaways are this. First, that the 
Uh, the cost of producing solar energy has declined remarkably. I mean, it's just uh, the curve that shows that uh, uh, is, uh, is a very hopeful uh, curve. And I think that the more people are aware of that, that this is not the solar industry of 2009. This is a much different industry. And it's one that can produce power very, very cheaply and competitively. Uh, the second takeaway, I think, is that uh, the uh, that the next technological breakthrough, and I understand from reading about this and uh, uh, it, uh, from people who are working in the industry, is the is the question of storage, and that once this once the storage issue technology advances, then we will really have a robust uh, energy source. Uh, and the third takeaway is that in order to make the transition, what we require are institutions and governments with deep pockets who can make investments to actually kickstart this and, and to move the, uh, the, the, the production of solar uh, into much higher gear very, very quickly. So those, I think, are the, ta are the takeaways. And of course, what the implications of that might be for the resolution of conflict in the Middle East uh, that's a really interesting question. There's a lot to discuss there, and, I'm, and I'll just leave that open as a question because I think there's a lot to discuss. So the other comment that I want to make is a question that came from, uh, from Harvey Hamburg, who asked about an article in, that was in Haaretz, which is on a, a somewhat unrelated but partly related topic. It's an article uh, that, that appeared the, uh, with the title, The Sea Will Get As Hot As a Jacuzzi that talked about the warming of the Mediterranean and the challenges that, that are associated with that. And uh, Harvey mentions that that article is only available to people who are hard subscribers. Uh, you can find that article on my website. So, uh, so if you go to Environment and Climate in the Middle East and put in the, the search, uh, those of you who are interested in reading that and other related topics can find that. It, it so was on the weekend supplement of ours in yeah. last year. Yes, I remember it well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to thank Dan for writing this book, not just for being here, but I think that uh, that uh, calling these issues to our attention and hopefully for building up the, the public momentum uh, within the field of experts and also within the, the well-informed general public. It's a very important service. So I really appreciate that this book is, has come out, and I hope that uh, you have a lot of success in, uh, in placing it in lots of hands. Uh, you, uh, I was, uh, the other place that you might place it is in the hands of Najib Saab, who is the, uh, the founder and executive director of the Arab Federation for Environment and Development, who's been out of Lebanon, who's been working in environmental sustainability since the Carter administration. He really has been a, a very dedicated. Uh, and his work is also available on the internet. And if you go to environment, the Arab Federation for Environment and Development, if you search for that, you'll find uh, the things that they produce. They produce a number of annual, they produce annual reports on environmental sustainability in the region. Uh, and, and, and they're quite good. So, so thank you again, Dan. David, thank you for your comments and for your participation. Karen, thank you for uh, the willingness of JSpace to, to, to host this and to be our co-sponsor. Thank you, David. David Grosskind for the technical assistance, which really made this possible. So Karen, uh, you can now tell us what's going to happen next. Can I jump? Can I just thank you, Stuart. Karen, Karen oh. can I just uh, jump in for a moment and okay. say that I've, I've taken I've, I've taken the last few minutes to answer some of the um, Q and A um, presented in writing to some of you. So please have a look at that. Uh, and also, I put up a uh, notice in the chat box with a link to where you can buy a. Discounted, discounted copies of the book. Thank you. Sorry, Karen. And what we will do is we will, in our survey that we send to all the participants, we'll include these links so that if you can't quite get them from the chat or you don't have time to copy them right now, 
Um, certainly, I want to echo Stuart's thanks to David and to Dan. And Stuart, thank you so much. Uh, on this screen in front of us, I think we have three of the you know most outstanding uh, scholars and writers in this field. Uh, JSpace Canada really strives to partner with organizations that are like-minded and to bring this kind of um, outstanding caliber of discourse to our supporters and our constituents. So spread the word. And by the way, you know I'd be remiss if I didn't ask all of you who tuned in when you'll not only have the link to the discounted uh, copy, but you will have a link to make a donation if you can. It's a, a charitable donation to our educational foundation so that we can continue to bring you uh, these kinds of outstanding programs. Um, our next webinar uh, will actually be in partnership with Raja Khoury Conversations, where I will be in conversation with Peter Biro, uh, who's recently uh, edited a new book on the crisis in constitutional democracy and the need for courageous citizenship given the rise of such populism and other thinking and that will be on october 1st so watch for the information on that uh, on november 19th hold the date for our annual general meeting it needs to be virtual it will be with ken stern who, whose book has just come out on the conflict over the conflict which is the conflict in israel palestine issues on campus but he's also the author of the ira definition of anti-semitism so it will lead to some pretty exciting uh, conversation and god willing in 21 21 when we celebrate our 10th anniversary we'll be able to have another outstanding panel on environment issues and many other outstanding panels uh david thank you again stuart thank you again dan good luck with this book uh we look forward to to reading more about it uh it was exciting to me to see it was in the kind of language that most of us could understand and you didn't have to be an expert to really get a sense of the issues um thank you again all of you i hope when we send you the survey you'll let us know what other topics you would like to you would like to um par participate in or even contribute to and we will as j space canada continue to raise the voice of progressive zionists in canada and worldwide 